Next, we're going to zoom in on federal budget battles and the impact of the most dreaded word in this city, sequestration. Two people who've been on the front lines of those battles, Sean Donovan and Jason Furman. Sean Donovan is the director of the Office of Management and Budget. Before that, he was President Obama's first HUD secretary. Jason Furman is the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, and they're here to chat with my colleague, Derek Thompson. Um, uh, I was just saying, I, when I started with The Atlantic, uh, the budget was, was my beat, and, and I loved it. And um, you know, getting comments from people who lived outside of Washington, it always seemed to me like the budget um, unfortunately symbolized the things that they found to be most problematic with, uh, with, with the city and its politics, and that you know, the president would, would provide his budget, and the Republicans would consider it a fantasy. Republicans would offer their budget, the president would consider it a fantasy. And then the one thing that we did not want to become law, sequestration, designed explicitly to be so painful it could never be law, ends up becoming the law of the land. Um, but the reason that this moment is really interesting um, is that there is a possibility that the winds might finally be changing. This is something that we do say every year, but there is reason to think that this truly could be the year that, that is different. You have uh, Murray Ryan lifting uh, sequestration's effects for this year. Um, you have negotiations ongoing uh, to raise spending uh, potentially uh, for the out years of this decade. Um, and it's in that climate that we now have opposing budgets from the White House um, and the GOP. So first, Sean, can you just explain to us, give us a little bit of an overview of um, what the major differences are between the president's budget uh, and the GOP? Yeah. Well, first of all, as you, I think, rightly framed, we are at an important moment to make a decision. Without action, sequestration would actually return in 2016 in full force. And uh, literally this week, we saw, for the first time in some real detail, what House Republicans would do. Their so-called 302B allocations, which set spending levels for all the bills across the federal government, became public. They're actually going to be voting on the floor on the first two of their bills. So the rubber is hitting the road, so to speak, uh, and, and so this conversation is timely. I think at, at the highest level, and we could obviously talk more about specifics, at the highest level, um, the maybe shorthand way to describe the differences between the budgets uh, are best in the words of the president, which is, are, do we believe in middle class economics or do, do we believe in trickle down economics? And maybe to put a little meat on the bones there, basically what that means is we have a fundamental choice. As a country, what sequestration has been doing, but not only sequestration, is underinvesting in the critical things that we need to grow our economy and to grow the middle class, uh, whether that's investments that in the past have been bipartisan in research and innovation. Medical research is a good example. Uh, whether it's infrastructure, education, uh, a broad range of things. And going, let's be clear, going back to sequestration means hundreds of thousands, even millions in some cases, of people not getting job training, uh, of kids not getting the education that they, they need, uh, dramatic cuts in the investments that NIH and others are making in, in the basic research that kept our economy ahead. That's uh, what we've seen from the Republican budgets, and, and to do what? Basically, to be able to create a structure where the wealthiest Americans would continue to see their taxes cut. Um, that is not what we believe in. What the president has put forward is a budget that says, let's lift the sequestration caps fully on the non-defense side. Let's follow the bipartisan model that Murray Ryan laid out a few years ago, do dollar for dollar increases on the defense side. And I think most importantly, let's make sure that all of this is paid for with smart spending cuts and changes to the tax code, closing loopholes and other things, that actually go to what our long-term fiscal challenges are. We're investing too little on the, non on, on the non-defense discretionary side. There's broad agreement even among Republicans on that. But let's make sure that we pay for it by the smart fiscal reforms. And the, and the basic answer is, I think you're seeing those bright lines that the president's laid out. He will not accept a budget that locks in sequester. He will not accept uh, fixing defense without fixing non-defense that there is growing momentum around that, not just from Democrats, but Republicans as well. That's great. Jason, can you pick up the story on taxes, the major tax differences between the GOP and president budgets? On taxes, you have sort of a two worlds. Um, you have the world where the Republicans decide that a top priority 
is repealing the estate tax, which would benefit 5,400 households a year by an average of millions of dollars a year, cost hundreds of billions of dollars over the next decade. And you know whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, and I have a hard time understanding the argument for good, um, it itself goes beyond what's in the, the budget the Republicans passed, because they didn't set aside any money um, for this cost. So you have that, which I think shows how far apart we are on the individual side, and crystallizes, as Sean was saying, that difference between middle class economics um, and trickle down. But then at the same time, um, you have what I think have been a very s constructive set of um, discussions on the business side of tax reform. I think we really do agree on the need to lower the rate, to get rid of a lot of loopholes and make sure you're paying for that rate reduction, to have an international tax system that's a hybrid tax system, and finally to take the transition revenue from transitioning to a new business tax reform system and put it into financing um, America's infrastructure. So I think there's a real area that we should be able to work together on here that would be good for our economy, that wouldn't hurt our budget deficit. Um, you know, but at the same time, you really see this contrast in the other part of the tax debate. We're going to get to infrastructure in a second, but I want to hop uh, back on corporate income taxes. Because on the one hand, it's, it's good in, in the Washington world that Republicans and Democrats can agree on reducing the rate and then cutting out some of those loopholes. But for every single loophole, there is a very powerful constituency that is benefiting from it and does, and it's more it's more important for that constituency not to lose that loophole sometimes than it is for other constituencies to vocally say, I want the overall rate reduced. So you have this, this problem of actually getting the legislation through. Do you see anything about the climate in the corporate world, maybe outside of Washington, or maybe people that you're talking to um, who, who come in to visit or to lobby, that, that large corporations are changing their tune on allowing this sort of deal to happen where you don't have a lot of individual winners of the corporate income tax code because they benefit from long fought over loopholes and right. reductions. Right. I mean, there's no question that revenue neutral reform is challenging. It's a lot easier to pass trillions of dollars of tax cuts the way we saw a decade ago. Um, that also had losers, but the losers were you know, in the future, and it wasn't clear to them the way in which they were going to ultimately have to pay the cost for those tax cuts. Um, here, you're being transparent, honest, and straightforward about it that definitely creates um, a political challenge. I think on the other side is the United States has fallen so out of step with the rest of the world. We have the highest tax rate of any economy in the world. I think that's widely understood. It's widely understood why that's a problem. And there are features of our tax code, for example, the way we tax international income, which are the worst of all worlds. We collect very little revenue and we create a lot of distortions. And I think we can create less distortions, more flexibility, but also actually collect more revenues. You can't just ship all your profits over and report them in the Cayman Islands and not pay taxes to us here. So I think there's some real win-win opportunities, but I don't d dispute the, the, the challenge it'll be. On, on infrastructure, we had Larry Summers up here uh, about an hour ago, and he's been really bullish for the last few years and the fact that uh, borrowing costs in the United States are at historical lows, and the need for infrastructure investment is at historical highs. Um, the president's budget does not reduce the deficit the same way that the GOP budgets in the next 10 years just bring it essentially all the way down to zero. But it does reduce the deficit um, beyond the CBO baseline in January. Why not propose even more infrastructure spending? Why not use the budget to make an even more forceful case? We're going to remake this country because we are at a unique moment right now with U.S. borrowing costs to make a real difference in creating winners and not losers of the future, the way Jason said earlier. Well, I guess the answer to that is that not all spending is created equal. Not all investment, not all spending is investment. And I think this is really what comes back to the basic structure of what the president is proposing in the budget. Our view is that we have not been making the critical investments. In infra Infrastructure is one of them, but there's a broad range of others on education and training and research and innovation that actually will grow our economy and 
that are the critical investments for the future. And that's much of it on, not all of it, but much of it on the non-discretionary, uh, the non-defense discretionary side of the budget. On infrastructure, our proposal is building off business tax reform, a 40% increase in what we invest through the Highway Trust Fund and smarter investments as well. So we actually are proposing in our budget a very robust, aggressive package of those types of investments. What you see on the other side, and this is really where the savings in our budget come from, if you look out to the generational and the demographic shift that we're facing, whether it's Medicare and Medicaid, Social Security, in a range of areas, you know, it, math is simple here. We have more worker, more retirees per worker in this country in the decades going forward, and we've got to do something about that. And not only are we proposing that in our budget, almost $2 trillion of savings, we've actually made huge progress there. Our deficits have come down by two-thirds. If you look at medical cost growth in particular, we have the lowest, the slowest growth in medical costs that we've seen in 50 years. And that has had huge positive impacts for our long-term deficits. We need to build on that. We need to build on it by continuing to make smart reforms, and the ACA has been critical here. But also, immigration reform is a very good example of a pro-growth strategy, brings in more workers, rebalances our demographics, would save about a trillion dollars over two decades uh, in, in our deficits. And so what we really need to do is thinking about investing in the short run and the medium term in the things that are going to grow our economy, but making smart reforms uh, in the places that we can that really drive, that are driving the long run deficits. And that's exactly what Murray Ryan did. And that's why I think not only Democrats, but you even see this week a whole group of moderate Republicans that are voting for, in the Senate, uh, folks speaking up in the House, voting to replace sequestration with smarter cuts and revenue increases on the other side of the ledger. Jason, Sean mentioned one of my favorite stories, and I think one of the underreported sort of small miracles of the economy in the last five years, which is, which is the slowdown in healthcare spending. In 2010, the Urban Institute did an estimate of how much the country would spend on healthcare between 2014 and 2019. It recently revised those estimates down by $2 trillion, trillion with a T. Um, what is happening here? Why are health costs slowing down? And is, how much of that slowdown do you think is an outcome of the recession that we're still sort of digging our way out of? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this is one of the most undertold stories. Um, and I often contrast it with, I don't think there's a person in this room that the story on fracking, unconventional oil and gas, and the transformation that that's bringing to our economy and the global economy, I think everyone in this room knows that story. And my guess is not everyone in this room knows that health CPI is growing at the slowest rate in the last 50 years. That the three slowest years of real per capita health growth since we've started collecting the data in 1960 we're in 2011, 2012, and 2013. And your Urban Institute estimate points out what is increasingly understood, which is at first, in 2010, 2011, it seemed like, huh, maybe this is just the recession. Employers are cutting back on benefits. That's slowing the cost growth of healthcare. But just as soon as the economy starts recovering better, this will all go away. Well, guess what, 2014, the strongest job growth since the 1990s, the fastest decline in the unemployment rate since the 1980s, and the health cost slowdown not only didn't reverse, it actually deepened and extended itself. And for that reason, um, while the economy was part of the story, it's increasingly small part of the story and very little part of it going forward. What I think is happening is some um, trends that pre-existed the Affordable Care Act, changes in the way benefits are designed, some you know, random chances of blockbuster drugs coming off patent, a process that's reversing itself a little bit as drug prices are now rising. But then I think the Affordable Care Act um, both changed the way in which we reimburse hospitals and other providers and slowed the growth of health costs and increased um, alternative payment models, accountable care organizations, which now have millions of people in them, paying better for quality, having penalties for hospitals that have excessive readmission rates, and a whole range of things that I think we're just starting to see the benefit of 
and are going to have you know, more potential going forward. I think what all this means is it helps with the budget issues Sean was describing, um, helps us free up more room for investment. It helps with incomes of families, and in the short and medium run, it helps with jobs as it lowers the cost for employers so they're able to hire more. And if, Go ahead, if I could please, just pile yeah. on, on on two points here. One is just, just to be specific about the impacts. CBO did an estimate right after the Affordable Care Act was passed. So it already built in the, the payment structure changes and other things that were you know, directly affected by the Affordable Care Act. If you look at that estimate for what we would spend for health care in 2020 versus what CBO is now saying, the savings just in the year 2020 are over $200 billion. And so that is all reform of uh, our delivery system and other bigger changes that, the affordable, that were at the center of the Affordable Care Act. So one, just to be very precise, this is a huge, huge impact, over $200 billion in one year. Second, and you, you started with the point, you know, there's this sort of uh, game in Washington, oh, budgets are dead on arrival. We put in our budget this year the doc fix, the sustainable growth rate, so-called SGR uh, doc fix, the permanent fix that uh, was adopted last week. And just to be clear, that really builds on the Affordable Care Act in two ways. One, it really takes the delivery system reforms that we started in the Affordable Care Act and uh, amplifies them and adds some new features to them that were proposed in our budget. Second, all of the things that were used to pay for uh, that doc fix that are also things that will improve uh, lower costs well into the future, those came out of our budget as well. And so I think it's very important to recognize that what we're seeing is not just uh, sort of uh, uh, the understanding that you, you had and, and Jason talked about, that we really are seeing a, an enormous transformation of our system. But we have to recognize that this is the president's policies that are driving a lot of this, uh, this advancement and that they're becoming more and more bipartisan, uh, despite the fact that you may see railing against the right. Affordable Care Act more, more publicly and more politically. And that, that's a fair point on SGR. I, 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 want, I don't want to spend too much time on health care, but I want to ask one more question. And it's because you, know, you mentioned this, this number, the, the medical cost consumer price index change, which is probably not something that a lot of people in this room, certainly me, are getting sort of quarterly newsletters over. But it is, it could be one of the most important numbers in budgeting. Because if it changes... The most important. If the, I, I was trying to be a little bit euphemistic, but let's call it the most important number in budgeting. It, it, it's, if, if this number changes by a percentage point, it creates billions of dollars in difference in government spending 10 years from now. Um, it's the responsibility of both of you to project things that you don't know. And so in the budget, um, there is a projection of healthcare spending going forward. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think that medical cost, CPI, is going to continue to fall and stay low around 2.53%? Or do you think it's going to grow? You know, whenever you see a big change, there's always a good chance that partly it's a structural permanent change and partly it's a bit of luck or something transitory. And then as time goes on, the permanent part persists and the transitory part um, goes away. I think healthcare is probably like that. So some of what, you know, and we're seeing that already on the drug side. And I was saying it a few years ago that some of the dramatic decline in drug spending is just a coincidence of when certain drugs were coming off patent, and, and like now we're seeing hepatitis, hepatitis C drugs, drugs. Back, right. you know, in some sense that is. So you can always have things going like that in both directions. What I've done is, it matters a lot for the budget, but just for a typical family, if just one third of the slowdown persists, so two thirds of it was luck and goes away, and just one third, and so I'm being conservative here, I'm not projecting that, you know, even then, after a decade, a typical family will see their income go up by over $2,000 as a result of less of their budget being eaten by health care more being able to go to wages. So even if just a fraction of this persists, um, it's going to uh, be, be huge. Okay. A, a different way to, to frame that is that there are things that are knowable enough that we score them in the budget. And our budget this year proposed, for example, another $400 billion 
of savings from changes in Medicare and Medicaid. Some of those were used as the pay-fors for the, the bill that just got passed, the doc fix bill. But we have lots of others that are contained in the budget. And those are policy changes that we know enough about to be able to score them. And, and that is a big part, although it's tax changes as well, that bring us to the nearly $2 trillion in savings that our, our budget would achieve. But what I also think is perhaps the most exciting frontier is all of the innovation that the ACA, that investment in medical research is, is fueling, that frankly is at too early a stage. I mean, we're just a few years out from the Affordable Care Act passing. The upside uh, of those innovations is potentially enormous. So there are, as, as you've rightly said, trillions and trillions of dollars of savings that if the things that we're piloting and experimenting with that have come out of the Affordable Care Act work, um, the potential implications for, for the budget deficit and for American you know, well-being and, and, uh, and health going forward are, are enormous. And that's, um, you can't budget for them because they don't have the, the precision or you know, we don't fully know, but we have to be investing in that kind of innovation if we're going to reap the savings for decades to come. Right. Uh, Jason, moving from the most underrated story to probably the most reported story, I think that in economic journalism, it's shifted from where are the jobs to where are the wages. As you mentioned, 2014, the best year for job creation this century. Um, and yet, still, even despite the fact that in the last six months, we're averaging, I think, about 200,000 jobs created per month, uh, wage growth seems essentially stuck at the level that it was three or four years ago. Uh, what, what do you think is happening there? Um, and do you expect it to change soon? So I absolutely agree that wages are the biggest challenge we're facing as an economy. Um, I don't think we should overstate that challenge. And sometimes some of the reporting, I think, gets a little bit um, over torqued in that you know, what we care about is the difference between your nominal wage growth and inflation. So that's real wages. Um, real wages grew in 2013 at about 7 tenths of a percent. They grew in 2014 at about 8 tenths of a percent. And that rate of wage growth is faster than the wage growth we saw in the previous economic expansion from 2001 to 2007. So part of what you'd want to see of a stronger economy translating into real wage growth we are seeing, it's just inflation um, you know, is so low. It's certainly the case that towards the end of that period, those real wage gains happened more because the price of gasoline fell than because wages grew more quickly. And we can't count on the price of gasoline you know, falling forever at the same rate it's fallen for the last six months. We'll need you know, more wage gains. And you know, I expect we're going to get more of them as we continue to strengthen the economy. I think if we do a lot of what Sean was talking about in terms of investing in infrastructure, other steps to strengthen our economy, I think that would help wages. Continuing to take steps to slow the growth of health care, as we were talking about, that's actually a wage issue. Um, because less, more compensation well. goes toward wages yeah. rather than yeah. insurance. And, and ultimately, you know, the, the two biggest forces here are what are the productivity growth of our economy and how is that productivity being shared? And some things we're talking about, like trade, important step in the Senate Finance Committee last night of passing on bipartisan basis fast track authority. That'll help our productivity growth, business tax reform, infrastructure, all of that will help our productivity growth. And then steps like raising the minimum wage will help more people share in the benefit of that growth. And then expanding preschool or community college does both. It increases your productivity growth and helps more people share in it. And let me just yeah. uh, foot stomp on this for, for a second. And this goes back to your first uh, question about framing the differences between our, our budgets. You know, when, when the president said middle class economics, this is exactly what he's talking about. What can we do in the short run to try to grow wages? And that means uh, tax cuts for the middle class, raising the minimum wage, a range of things that are, that are in our budget. But also, what do we do in the medium and the long term? And that means investing more in education, uh, investing more in the right kind of retirements for Americans, investing in infrastructure. Trade, 95% of our customers are overseas. And we know, if you look at the, at the data, 
that the average wage in ex exporting industries is higher than uh, average wages overall uh, in, in America. So the, these are exactly the kinds of things we should be investing in. Just think about the contrast. Our budget proposes a broad range of tax cuts that go to 44 million families for childcare, for education, uh, to pay for college, for retirement. They cost exa almost exactly the same amount of money as the estate tax cut, which goes to 5,400 families. So let's just ask what the difference is. 5,400 families getting a tax break averages more than $3 million, or 44 million families to invest in the right things to, to grow our economy and to grow wages. Right. Seems like a pretty simple choice. Right. You, you've mentioned, you mentioned investments a lot, and you've mentioned you know, finding policies that can grow the economy, whether it's spending more in education, spending more in infrastructure. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, one interesting thing to me is that when you sort of take the historical look at the federal budget and how it's sort of broken down between uh, investments that you could, well, spending that you could plausibly call investments um, and spending that is, uh, I think, more appropriately categorized as insurance, you know, over the last 60 years, the United States, and frankly, every single developed country around the world, has shifted a lot of its spending uh, away from the first category and toward the second, uh, toward insurance. Um, you know, th this is a concern that I've seen raised not only by, uh, by conservative economists, but also by liberals, that it's possible that we're directing too much of our spending um, to old people. Um, which is fine. Certainly the, the poverty rate among senior citizens has fallen by a lot in the last 50 years. But it raises this question of, in an environment of falling non-defense discretionary spending, uh, plus the th risk of sequestration coming back in 16 and 17, um, has, has this budget picture, has this, this balance between investments and insurance perhaps swung too far towards the latter? I think there's no question. And that is what has motivated the basic policy choices and uh, the way that the president has uh, spent his political capital, if you will. Um, first of all, that means we have to uh, try to do something about the demographics. Immigration reform is perhaps the most important thing that we can do to rebalance the number of workers that we have versus retirees. Healthcare costs, as we talked about, are the single most important uh, driver of for the, popula the population of retirees um, a a as our country ages. What are we doing to, to bring down costs? Obviously, the president has focused a lot there and we're making real progress. But it also means that we need to uh, restructure our priorities, both on the tax side of the ledger and on the discretionary spending side of the ledger, to invest more and to ask the wealthiest to pay a little more. And the president has done that. But, but Let's remember where we are. We've, we've reduced our spending by about $4 trillion since the president came into office. 80% of that has come from the spending side, only 20% from the tax side. So we need more balance. That has driven a lot of the choices we made in the budget. But I also think this isn't just the president. And, and I really do believe what led to getting a Murray-Ryan deal a couple of years ago, what is leading to more and more, not just Democrats, but Republicans saying, that a Murray-Ryan sort of 2.0 is the right thing to do this year is because fundamentally people are, are it, it's gaining momentum, the idea that the right choice to make, invest more on the discretionary side, particularly the non-defense discretionary side, and pay for it with longer run changes, uh, smart spending cuts, and changes to the tax code. You saw six Republican senators vote for an amendment when the budget resolution came to the floor in the, in the Senate that would do exactly that. Raise spending dollar for dollar on the defense and the non-defense side, pay for it, not just with changes uh, to health care and, and other uh, entitlement programs, but also literally use the words tax revenues. And so I think, uh, you know, Republicans have a choice. Are they going to follow the path of just continuing mindless cuts of sequestration or to take this choice that the president is calling for? And I think we have a real shot uh, to get that done this year. We've, we're going to go to Q&A. Do you want to say something really yeah, quickly? Just, just, to, just to add two points to that. Sure. One is I, I obviously completely agree with Sean. Um, <laughs> uh, and some of these historical comparisons um, get a little bit complicated by the fact that you know, Social Security has grown as a share of the economy, not because we're more generous, but because there's more seniors relative to the population. Um, you know, that you know, to ask you the question of what can we do to, to pay for that, but it doesn't say you know, the entitlements are out of control. Healthcare, 
has grown, again, partly because of that, but even more because of system-wide health costs. So it's not a government budget problem as much as it is what's going on in the health system as a whole. Now, we can be leaders for the health system, and we're doing that in some of these alternative payment models in Medicare, where we can do something in the private sector, can follow our example. I think that's part of why you see um, this, this slowdown. But I think it's important in this historical context to do that. The second thing is, um, it's not always a rigid distinction between programs that are about investment and growth and programs that are about insurance. Um, we keep talking about healthcare, so I'll use that as an example here again. Um, the Affordable Care Act frees you up to move from job to job without worrying about whether you're going to have health insurance in your next job. It frees you up to take more of a chance in starting a business, knowing that if you fail, um, you know, there'll be all sorts of consequences, but one of them won't be that you end up um, uninsured. You see other insurance programs. Social Security is one of the top two insurance program, uh, programs for low-income ch for children and um, lifts more children out of poverty um, than any program except maybe the EITC. That helps those children invest more um, in their future and, and grow and succeed in the economy. And there's an increasing amount of economic literature, Medicaid too, that shows people who get Medicaid today have, are more likely to graduate from school, more likely to have jobs, have higher earnings 10, 20 years from now. So I think insurance can often help people get back on their feet, succeed, and grow. Good answer. Thanks. Uh, we have time for some questions. I believe the mic is there. Dr. Barry Strouch uh, from Inova Fairfax Hospital. The slowdown actually started in healthcare in 2005 and was straight down, and several studies um, have associated it with GDP decrease to the point of 75% of the effect on slowdown in healthcare costs. And the Altarum Institute and Kaiser Family Foundation using a month-to-month -month analysis for 2014, and the CBO and CMS do not report data pre-2014 yet, but Kaiser Family Foundation and Altarum project indicate that their data shows a 5% increase in health care in 2014, which means a significant rise has occurred. You may not be familiar with that data, and I'm not asking you to criticize it, but if you used it and accepted it as possible, how would that affect what you're saying? And, and lastly, I do agree that Medicare has several strong programs through ACA that are changing behavior and saving money but the increased number of people on Medicare is starting every year at en enormous rates. And again, that data from 2014 may have flipped over. Uh, thanks for that. Um, and we could spend a long time talking about this topic, but let me just be brief. Um, absolutely, the slowdown predated the Affordable Care Act. I usually date it to about 2007. But health costs have gotten even slower since then. Um, so the Affordable Care Act piled on to a set of things um, that were going on. Second, um, you referred to some data on it being the economy and some analysis. I've read those studies. I think those studies have a number of problems, but regardless, um, most of them are about two years old, and the slowdown has deepened since then, so it's become increasingly less tenable. You know, one other example is you've seen the slowdown in Medicare, um, even more than in private insurance. Medicare isn't affected by the business cycle um, in the same way. So that's just another reason to think that something going on here um, that's not the economy. In terms of your third, I certainly do look at, at all of those data. And just super fast, and I've done speeches that are on the Council of Economic Advisors website if you want to read more about this. You can think of health costs, how much it costs to treat a particular thing. That's measured by the CPI. That's the slowest in 50 years. You can think of health costs per beneficiary. That's also growing at historically low rates. Then in 2014, we had a big bump up in the number of beneficiaries. And so that raised total spending. That was a good thing, because those were people who went from spending very too little to having insurance and being able to spend more. For the people who already had insurance, their costs continued to grow slowly. So it was good for them, too, and fine for them, too. Um, but that's what you're picking up in, in those data that you referred to. And just the only other quick thing I would say there is um, there's no question that we've sort of priced into the budget forecasts the uh, 
specifics both about the number of, uh, of folks that will join. And if anything, um, those have come in lower than we've expected over the last few years. And so we've seen savings relative to budget projections. We continue to uh, project expansions going forward. So that's sort of baked in, as is an expectation that cost growth will be faster in the next. So if you look at our budget CBOs, we do project faster cost growth because we are attributing at least a portion of this to the recession. Uh, I think 5% would be uh, higher than we would, we would expect, and I think most others would, would expect, but we certainly are looking at higher cost growth in the future. And, and you know, uh, so we could be surprised on the upside, but we could also be surprised on the downside there. One right there. Yeah, Alex Yellen, Center for Naval Analyses. I was recently at a conference when we discussed the opportunities for private financing of federal uh, capital investments. Uh, one of the key limitations to that is the OMB scoring rules. Uh, one of, in fact, one of the speakers characterized OMB as the place where good ideas go to die. And Thank I you. wanted to see whether, whether you think that uh, this is a time when the scoring rules should be reexamined. So um, despite, uh, you know, uh, the, the saying that uh, all good ideas go, go to die at OMB. Um, I, I actually believe that the more fundamental problem here is we're shortchanging uh, all types of investments, including capital investments. And if you look at the president's budget this year, we have proposed uh, dramatic increases in capital investments of all kinds. Infrastructure is one, one example, but in uh, federal buildings, in energy efficiency, in a broad range of things. And the simple truth is that uh, the federal rules, uh, we have adapted them, for example, on energy savings performance contracts and a range of other things to make smart investments where we can prove that there's savings in the long run. Um, but no matter what we, we do with those rules, there would still be too little investment going into those things because scoring rules can't create money at the end of the day. Uh, what, they, what will create money is Congress making the right choices about investing in, uh, in the right things, including more capital investment. And so I, I, I agree with you we ought to be doing more on that. And we've put our, uh, our money where our mouth is in terms of a budget that really would uh, push us in that direction. Right there. Uh, Stuart Gerson, Epstein, Becker, and Green, a law firm. Uh, let me ask about two somewhat related but different different things. I mean, I, uh, you're, you're extolling... I you, we have about two minutes, so if you make those two things um, super brief, that'd be great. Uh, you're extolling a slowing in the rate of increase of health care costs. If you look at our GDP uh, percentage that, are go that is going to health care compared to other uh, first world nations, uh, we still see a gap at a time when the ACA is drawing more people towards... Medicaid and the population is getting older and as you pointed out the Medicare population was going to increase How over the long term are we going to achieve significant savings to decrease the percentage of GDP that uh, goes into health care? The other part is can you comment on student loans which uh, seem to be an, an increasing and potentially troublesome uh, part of the of, of, of the debt calculus so on your first, um, health costs today are a little bit smaller as a share of GDP than they were a few years ago, so we're making progress. I absolutely agree with you that contrast to other nations um, gives us some sense of how much more progress um, we could make. That's why um, as Sean was talking about the doc fix. I think that is going to help. And Sean also talked about some of the proposals in our budget that would reform both the structure of Medicare benefits to have um, it'd be more value-oriented, as well as the way we pay providers. So we're definitely not done, but I don't think that should, um, you know, make us not understand the significant progress um, that we've made. Your second question is a really big one, and we can have a fuller discussion the next time we're back here. I think the important facts are that the largest segment of consumer debt outside of mortgage is student loans, so it's something worth taking seriously, worth paying attention to. I think it's also important to know 
that the typical um, borrower ends up having you know, less than $25,000 in debt as against earnings that are two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars higher. So overall, college is a very good deal. Um, the worry we have is especially around the people that have a hard, you know, who don't graduate and can't repay or go to a bad institution or something like that. And so it's a little bit more a concern about the tail than it is about the typical. And steps that we've taken like income-based repayment, that if your income goes down, um, can give you more um, forgiveness of your loans. Steps to prioritize college completion, to improve the quality of especially for-profit schools with a set of regulations that go under the heading of gainful employment. All of that are oriented at what is the clearest student debt problem we have. You know, overall worth monitoring, but overall not worth throwing out um, the baby with the bathwater when the returns to college are just so high um, relative to the cost of college. Yeah, and, and just a couple of things I would, I would add on there to uh, sort of compound Jason's point, a, a, a great share of the growth in student debt is more people are going to college, right? And so that is a, a good thing. Um, I also think it's important to recognize that debt, student debt, what we do within the student loan program, how we structure repayments, et cetera, is one piece of the puzzle. But let's remember that the broader question here is, what does college cost? And do enough people have access to it? And that's why the president has uh, made historic changes in the student loan program, took the savings, put them into more Pell Grants. It's why this basic discussion we're having about what we do, uh, what, what we choose as investments versus uh, simply cutting taxes further, that basic choice we're making. Pell, a range of other things are critically important in making sure we minimize the amount of debt that, that particularly low-income students need to take, and also why we ought to be restructuring our tax system to do more for the middle, middle class. And the president proposed a substantial expansion uh, in the American Opportunity Tax Credit and, a, and an overall restructuring and increase in what we do for uh, helping families pay for college through the tax system. That was part of these middle class tax changes that I talked about earlier. And so this does come back to the basic choice that we're making uh, in our budget uh, of what, we, uh, what, what, what our preferences are and uh, how we uh, make those choices in the political uh, fight we're going to see over the budget over the next few months. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.